Hey everyone, uh, I'm Dan Proft. I am the Senior Manager of Engineering for Continuous Delivery at GitLab. Um, GitLab, I think most people are aware of, but we're uh, a, a full DevOps lifecycle tool that is hosted in the cloud or self-managed. And I manage the continuous delivery uh, group of teams, which is configure, uh, release, and package. Um, and we're going to have a bit of a chat, uh, answer some questions from people in my forum, and uh, just going to start taking questions now. I guess I'll, I'll kick it off then, Dan. So I know we talked multiple times about the organization uh, and how transparent everybody is and everything in the meetings and everything is documented and in the face of it, I've been fascinated by that quite a bit relative to the organization that I'm a part of. Can you maybe talk us through some of the pros and cons or maybe just one pro, one con of, of being so heavily documented? Yeah, for sure. Thanks for the question, Slavisa. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I think the documentation you could look at from multiple angles. Um, there's a sort of a diversity, inclusion, belonging angle where everyone knows kind of what an expectation is and what they can expect, which is um, really appreciated. Um, it's clear to everyone. Uh, there's an efficiency perspective from that as well. So I'm aligning this with our values. Um, and efficiency is that it's in one place uh, and everyone gets to see the same thing, which is cool. Uh, I think one of the drawbacks that you can have from um, uh, having everything documented is just that documentation has its own inertia uh, and changing it can be difficult. Um, and if people don't feel empowered to change it, then it becomes static. Uh, and at the point it becomes static, you're not really evolving the processes. We, we try to have the everyone can contribute model where you know anyone can go and suggest a change, you all could create an account and go in and make a change in our documentation. Um, but the more heavy, heavy the structure is around that and the more difficult it seems to make a change, the harder it is for someone to want to go and get over that, that sort of the barrier to entry is basically what that is, I think. Um, you know, I think even beyond the documentation, the transparency is really valuable. You can go on YouTube on GitLab Unfiltered and look at teams ha having their team meetings. You can go watch one. There's a heap of them up right, right now, um, which is really, really interesting um, and has been very valuable in my experience for having customers, potential um, you know, candidates for roles that we have open, um, other team members across GitLab watch the videos and actually know what's going on. They're like, oh, yeah, I watched the video the other day. Um, which is pretty pretty interesting. Um, and I've actually had that happen in a couple of interviews for me where a candidate's gone, oh, yeah, I've been watching your team videos. I, I know about this person and that person on the team. And you're like, it, it feels amazing. It's really cool, but it's also kind of scary at the same time. <laughs> um, so that's really cool. But I think in terms of the way we do things at GitLab, something that I really love about that transparency value is um, one of the things that my teams and a lot of other teams at GitLab do is the engineers are doing updates like a stand-up asynchronously on the issue they're working on. So as a customer or just an interested person, you could go look at an issue that they're working on and you can see their latest update every time they've done something. So if you're really interested in that feature making it into production, you can actually track it. Um, and you can track the issue not only in their update notes, but it links to the merge request, the actual code they're writing. And you can look at the code and go, oh, that's how they're doing that. Maybe you want to contribute yourself. Maybe you want to just let the team know when something is coming. So there's a lot of really good value there. Um, but it does take a lot of, it takes a lot of energy to maintain that level of transparency, um, particularly at an organization as it grows, as you, you know, from your industry, you know, there's a lot of stuff that you can't share. So in the context of this conversation, there's certain things in my head that I'm kind of just not going to say. <laughs> because you can't, you know, personal things about someone, people's names I wouldn't mention, even though if they're on the call, they're there. So that type of thing. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. And maybe I'll quick follow before someone else jumps in. So do you guys have a periodic review cycle of these documents? I, I know for us, it's usually, that's kind of the biggest pain point. We're quickly to put together documents, but then quickly within a few months, it's already outdated because we've changed the process or the architecture or the whatever but we don't really go back to the document. So do you guys, how do you guys ensure that? I know you say it's cumbersome, but how do you ensure that it does stay alive with the rest of the, the organization evolving? Right. It depends on the type of documentation you're talking about. If you're talking about code documentation, we build that into the actual act of you know, doing some work in the code base, um, normal sort of documentation practices. And our definition of done includes, it needs to be documented at some level. It's not necessarily a blocker all the time, but we have a technical writing 
team that comes in and reviews everything and makes sure it's actually accurate. Um, we also have uh, other members of the team that aren't just engineers who are, say, a technical account manager or someone will come in and go, oh, I did this thing and my customer was asking about it. It wasn't in the documentation. And then feedback there is for them to update their documentation, do an MR, they can also change it. So it's it's more about having this model of, you know, using it and updating it all the time, which is GitLab doesn't really do culture, but it's one of the things that we encourage among our teams, which is to say, if you see anything wrong in the documentation for whatever feature, fix it. It needs to be fixed. It's for our customers. It's for our own use. We use it ourselves. So when we refer to the documentation that you're all looking at, that's our documentation too. So that helps. And I think when we talk about, say, the handbook, the handbook's a little different because the handbook is like, okay, this is our way of doing a thing. Um, uh, and if we keep doing it that way, the time from when we updated it to, to now gets further and further you know, apart. And so then there is that inertia that comes along. So those can be a little more difficult because it comes just human beings sometimes tend towards sort of, um, oh, it gets written down here. That's the way we have to do it. And, you know, it gets that inertia down. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Questiones from other people? Yeah, um, so GitLab's all about kind of the async communication, um, you know, async time. Um, can you talk a little bit about the overhead um, of, you know, basically communicating asynchronous and, and kind of pros and cons? Yeah, for sure. It's a good, it's a really good one. It's been one of the most interesting things for me. I've been at GitLab coming up to a bit over a year and a half. You know, April will be two years for me. Um, it's a really, really interesting element. Most of the companies that do remote um, or had been doing remote prior to COVID, of course, where everyone's, a lot of companies, if not everyone's been doing remote at some level. Um, what with the time zone distribution, you necessarily have some lag in communication, depending on where the person is you need to talk to. Now you try and distribute out the people you need to talk with about something or other. Um, uh, but say, for example, someone's doing a review and they're, you know, it's funny because the, the way time happens around the world, it happens in sequence and it's necessarily in that direction. So if you're separated by, say, eight hours from the person that's doing your review, you might actually finish at the end of your day and then overnight they get to it and then they update it. And so there's this sort of lag built in sometimes with those, with those processes you wouldn't normally see if you had a time zone um, centered team or a shared time zone for an organization, sort of like um, um, Envision does, or I think um, uh, uh, some of the other, not, not Alphabet, the other one. Uh, anyway, um, so that's what a lot of companies do. And, and because a lot of bigger companies have gone remote, I think they're starting to work on these sorts of things. So um, building in that sense of like, there could be a delay here, um, but spreading it across the whole org, it doesn't end up being as bad. I mean, in isolation, it can feel really bad because there's a long delay between an action being taken but because that person's also got a code review in that's happening as they're asleep and it's ready to go when they wake up and they finished it the last, you know, at the end of their day, that happens as well. So I think overall it balances out quite well. Um, for the In terms of communication, what it enables is, and I'd sort of bring it somewhat back to diversity, inclusion and belonging as well is, as an engineer and efficiency, as an engineer, I, I might finish a merge request and I'll complete that. And then at the end of my day, I'm gonna update the issue and say, hey, uh, there's this work, it's in context, I can write down notes, I can share what's going on, I can put it in my issue, I can put in my comments, post it up, and then I can finish my day. And then the next person comes along and because we engage in asynchronous communication models, they people expect to come in and when something's missing, we sort of try to build patterns for everyone to use where we're always providing sufficient information. Um, but what that means is for, for what I was talking about before in terms of transparency and having asynchronous issue updates, it means that you're not asking that person to remember context for a stand up the next day. What you're doing is you're actually saying, hey, just put the context in the issue when you're done so that you can just work in your time zone and you don't have to be worrying about lining it up with someone else. You know, as a company that maybe has one office in one location, these are all things you don't really have to worry about. But as we start distributing it around, 
um, forcing people into a specific time zone has really negative impacts, I think. And because it's like, okay, you wake up and work from five to midnight or something, you know, and that's weird for people. Um, even throwing people off, like I used to work at a company I used to work for, I used to get up at six and work till three or four or whatever. Um, because they were on the East Coast and I was on the West or whatever it was, right? That's throwing off my day. That's good for me. You get a, like a lot of day. But then if you do it in the other direction, someone's on the East Coast working with the company on the West Coast, you're like all thrown off in the other direction. So just I, I think that the benefit there is makes it easier for people. And it means that people who are, you know, you have children, you have a family, you have a family member that needs support. You're not on the clock for eight hours and, you know, start at this time and end at that time. We're looking at results. We're looking at output. Um, and that's an important factor there as well, I think. Um, overall, I think it's it's been really good. Um, again, so when we've talked about async, uh, going remote, uh, when we all had to go remote to some level and then to quite a large level, um, I'm kind of like, well, what are you trying to achieve? Are you trying to replicate the models you had in existence prior to having to go remote? with the expectation that you'll be going back? Or are you looking to optimize for remote? And that's the difference between remote friendly and remote first. You know, those two things are very different. And because we have the async factor built in at GitLab, um, like most of the teams, all the teams report up to me have people in APAC and all the way to Eastern Europe. So, you know, it's an interesting thing to think about. I hope that answers your question, Connie. Yeah, I, th I think so. I, I do have a, a follow-up question um, around kind of, I'm curious if you have um, A, adapted your schedule to async. So, do, you know, do you not work uh, a contiguous period of time? Um, and then, you know, do you have like a synchronous group that you kind of, or a group that you, you interact with a little more synchronously than people maybe outside of the time zone? Or is it um, really across the board uh, all communication tries to be asynchronous first? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think for managers, it's a little bit weird um, because you, you're going to adapt your schedule to your team and where your team is. Uh, you know, I'm going to still have one-on-ones. It's not like I'm going to do one-on-ones asynchronously. If my team happens to be in a similar time zone to me, then it's not a big deal. You can just operate at some schedule. I personally prefer to be basically contiguous through my day, but I work with people who aren't. Um, for whatever reason it might be, whether that's family reasons or, you know, they go out and exercise during the day and that's fine. And so what we're trying to do is build models that support both methods of working. Um, in terms of my peers at GitLab, I'm relatively synchronous with those people. And so we app operate fairly synchronously, but at the same time, we're still doing sort of GitLab standard ways of doing things, which are meant to enable asynchronous communication, like having the agenda before a meeting, you can put questions in the night before and then not attend the meeting and watch the video later, you know, and that's that models in every meeting, aside from like private things like one-on-ones and stuff like that, where you'll have an agenda, but it will be restricted to the people that are in the actual meeting. Um, uh, and so it's, we try to do both because we're trying to make it possible and effective for people to do one or the other, depending on what model they want to follow so that they can be productive. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thank you. That's extremely insightful. Appreciate it. You're welcome. So I, I have a follow-up to something you said in response to Slavisa. Um, you mentioned there's like a specific uh, inertia around documentation and changing it now. And I'm curious, you know, you, you, you've been there for, like you said, a year and a half. And, you know, GitLab's been around a lot longer. And as you guys keep on growing, how do you, um, how do you balance that potentially like growing inertia or, or inability to change documentation with a growing company and like is there any sort of process that is uh kind of a self-awareness for the company itself to say like hey is this becoming too difficult or or is that a problem at all does that make sense yeah yeah it makes sense that's a good question i mean i think we're sort of trying to find and it's a problem to be solved because we're pretty unique in the way we do things and we already were and then we're uniquely experiencing something that other companies experience as well in terms of growth and getting to a point where we're you know uh you know needing some process and how much is effective um and i think in terms of you know our documentation and i'll use the handbook as the example you know we've started having owners of certain areas because this stuff goes live to the internet you know when you look at something that's in our handbook that's our handbook 
And so we've had a com- couple of scenarios where we've had really negative responses from, uh, you know, broader sets of people outside of GitLab. Uh, and I think what's interesting about that is we, you know, our example is we're being, we're doing this transparently. You see the merge request and people complain about it because they don't like some implication. Um, I'm not suggesting that it's good or bad or, or it's unwarranted or warranted, but, you know, there's a, there's a large response. And so how do we sort of make sure we're validating the things we're doing and they're going to end up in the handbook? One of the things we're doing is code owners. So you'll have code owners around certain areas of the handbook so that that's stuff that's being updated. Now, if there's a code owner that signifies some sort of authority and, and is an impediment to just making an MR request and having someone review and merge. Um, and so some of those processes are, um, uh, are slowing down the change, the rate of change, I think, but they are trying to solve specific problems that the organization has had. Um, and I think, I think what's interesting is um, it, as we've grown as well and new people have joined, it's kind of there. Whereas maybe for a lot of people who were there early on, those new areas of the handbook appeared. And so they've, they've been present for that change. And so they're like, they're more kind of, I think people are a little bit more connected with the fact that, oh, you could just add these things or remove them if they're not good. Um, and I think if you show up and there's this 3,000, 5,000 page document, it's pretty hard to sort of think about it as a, a constantly in, in a state of change, even though it is. Um, and I think the other thing we try to do is have multimodal communication that goes, we put it in multiple places, Slack, there's you know, various threads, people get notifications through team communication you know, to, to try to get keep people informed of changes that are happening. Does that answer your question, Scott? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Welcome. I have one kind of follow up to Carney's question. Um, I think, you know, a lot of companies are looking to permanently stay remote or a portion remote. And, you know, asynchronous communication is probably foreign to a lot of people. Um, so I'm just curious when you're hiring people, they probably aren't. Too, aren't too familiar with this process. Is it kind of difficult for them to get in a groove with that? Is it something that you think can be adopted by other companies or do they have to kind of buy fully into like the, the manifesto that they, that uh, GitLab put out to kind of really do it successfully? Um, I'm going to give the classic answer to this. It depends. <laughs> um Depends on the person, you know, some people adapt pretty well. Some people are used to communicating with, with PRs or MRs, right? And, and so they're used to having that bit of async communication. If you've been an open source and you've written code or pushed up a change to something or other, you're probably pretty used to getting that async comms happening. Now in a work context, maybe you're not, maybe you're used to being in an office and that takes a little bit of adaption. And that's, that's true for anyone that goes remote for the first time, I think, because it's different. You know, how do I hold myself accountable to things I need to deliver? Uh, when there's no one standing over my shoulder and I've used to have that happening for most of my career. Um, so I think that's a big factor, but I also think that the story that we tell people has to mean something, you know, why are we asynchronous? We're asynchronous for a reason. And it's, there's some, a lot of really good reasons. I've mentioned diversity, inclusion, belonging many times. You could look at someone who lives in the Midwest somewhere who GitLab has been, been remote, has no office and has been this way for, for years and years. Um, and that was like, hey, you can live wherever you want. You can go wherever you want, and it's fine. I think that the interesting thing is that as companies, as you said, want to stay remote, perhaps, you know, the async communication has to make sense if you're going to ask people to do that. In GitLab's context, it totally makes sense because we have team members all over the world. If you're going to hire all over the world, you probably want to start thinking about whether you want to go async or you want to have shared time zones and why so that you can make it so that it makes sense to team members that you're asking to do something a certain way. Um, and some people are going to be happier with that change than other people. Um, it is really efficient. Once people try it in the context of GitLab, seeing really good results with single source of truth, which is one of the things that we're really keen on. Uh, and something I'm really keen on is self-service as well. Is like, I don't want you to have to ask anyone for information because they may not be available when you're looking for the information. So how do you find it yourself? I mean, I sort of align that with the single source of truth and, and transparency, efficiency stuff with um, documentation and handbook being available. Um, 
Does that answer your question, Mike? Yeah, thanks. Yep. All right, I got another one for you. Um, so I think most of us don't work for fully remote organizations, at least I have not. And, you know, we have offices throughout the U.S., and, but typically everybody is in the office. For the most part, there are some exceptions. Um, I mean, as we know, this pandemic has kind of turned a lot of that upside down, and most of us are now struggling to figure out the remote situation. And there's been plenty of headaches around processes and, and, and just, uh, you know, anxiety and just a lot of other things in general for employees to go from not remote to remote. How has this impacted, if at all, your organization who's already been fully remote? Because that's one thing that we always talk about. Had we been fully remote, this would not have any impact on us. So in general, has there been any impact uh, to get lab to the employees, to, to the productivity in general, to even just, you know, general amount of health and, and engagement during this whole pandemic? Yeah, I mean, everyone's impacted by this at some level. Um, it's been a really big deal for everybody, whether we worked from home before or not. Um, everyone's life is impacted in some way. Family members that are at risk, not being able to go outside, you know, and not being able to do the things we always do. Everyone's uh, impacted as far as I've been able to tell. I don't mean to suggest that I know everyone's feelings, <laughs> obviously, but like it's a bit of a very common refrain that people are all pretty stressed out and um, frustrated. I think, uh, I think you can take it as read that that's a pretty common experience regardless. Um, when it, as it pertains to the organization, I think one of the interesting factors is GitLab had a differentiator of having remote as always being, you know, we had no office. Um, and now everyone's kind of going remote and struggling to catch up. So that means there's a lot more um, competition in the marketplace for, the, for really talented humans. Um, and that's, that's having an effect, although we're not hiring a heap, um, uh, you know, like a lot of companies, we sort of took a view of hiring and said, all right, let's hold off and see what happens. And and so we're continuing on that track. But as people start opening up hiring, because we're all trying to still, you know, move forward and there's attrition and people move on and change roles and everything, you know, I could see that being more of a factor. Um, travel. We had multiple team members who were stuck in one country or other when the border got closed and they were there for some amount of time. Um uh, and that's a pretty significant, you know, factor in life of like, oh, I'm in this country that I didn't intend to be in for three months and here I am, you know. Um, so that's a factor, but relatively temporal. Um, and I think the, I think the idea that uh, because we're already home and I've experienced this myself, that everything's cool. And I did, I'm, I'm not saying you implied that. I, I know that's not what you meant. Um, it almost feels like I should be okay, but I'm not. Like it's different and none of us get to do the things we'd like to do. Um, and that's not even compared to places where they're much, much more strict than the US, for example. Um, and that's true for a lot of our team members. So that, I think that sort of sense that we have of our team who maybe for some people are all remoted, uh, excuse me, all located in the US, that's not anywhere near the same experience that other people in other countries have had. Um, because, you know, I think Melbourne did a 111 day lockdown when you couldn't go more than 5Ks from your house and you're allowed outside for an hour a day for exercise. That's a very different experience from a lot of places in the US. And so accounting for that across your team that's vastly distributed around the world, um, it's going to impact everyone a little differently, I think. Does that answer your question? What's GitLab's take on um, kind of standardization of policy versus kind of letting teams run on their own, right? Because you guys do have a single source of truth for a lot of things and your, your handbook and, and policy does talk about a lot. Um, so what's, you know, as, as a manager, um, you know, what's the management stance on kind of like letting teams run on their own versus uh, creating standardized uh, methods of doing things? Yeah, I think I think in general, I, this is a great question. I love this question. Thank you for asking. Um, I think in general, we like to provide people guidance on on ways that we might like to do things. So a good example is the product development flow of like what how we go about the process of developing stuff for our customers. Um, but there's a fair amount of flexibility given to teams because we want to talk about output. We want to talk about KPIs and measures so that we can be driving towards the goal of achieving whatever it is in terms of that output, not the input. 
Um, and that's a pretty common thing with GitLab. So we do get a fair amount of flexibility. Uh, but again, I think that sort of depends on the stage we're at. Uh, we recently, a little while ago, changed from you know focusing really more purely on velocity and focusing a bit more on security and availability. And that means the emphasis on some of our KPIs changed. So talking about what we call MR rate, which is the number of MRs per um, engineer per month. Um, and we prefer to narrow MR right now, which is just the members of the specific team that we're talking about. Um, maybe, maybe we're not trying to target 20 MRs a month or whatever it is. Maybe we're happy with 11 and then we're going to focus a little more on quality and security or availability and security. Um, so I think... Um, how we achieve that result when we're talking, starting to get into the realm of predictability starts to matter. But I think the way we communicate the status of the work and where things are at, that's kind of the, the through line in addition to KPIs and what we're accountable for. And this is a bit of a nebulous answer, but in general, we give people a fair amount of autonomy. And over time, as we start getting to a point where we need to be more we start caring about predictability at some level. You've got to start making some trade-offs, but the way we talk about it is more like, okay, what do we mean by predictability? Is it just discoverability? Is it, is it, you know, we have to all follow this specific process so that anyone can transfer? As the company grows, is there value in having the same pro exact process on one team to another as people move around in teams a bit more? Question mark. Um, and so I think in general, again, we provide really good guidance on how we think stuff should work. And if people are, are delivering results and performing really well and the team's happy and customers are happy, then yeah, you get a fair amount of autonomy. Um, uh, but that doesn't mean you get to just do whatever um, because, you know, we have product managers and, and, you know, customers and leadership and, you know, that people outside the org that want to be involved and want to understand. And I think that lines up with how everyone can, tr can contribute, you know, if, if it's all obfuscated, then how can anyone con contribute to that effort? I mean, if it's obfuscated because you're not using the labels that everyone says we should use for workflow, for example, you know, how easy it is it for people to participate and contribute to that? So um, in general, it's a conversation that's going on right now of like how much, how, how standard do we want to be? But historically, we've had a lot of autonomy and, and decisions. For my team, I want my team to make sure that it's discoverable, make sure a single source of truth, make sure it's it's um, self-service, make sure that we're committing to and delivering on what we commit to. Um, but I don't really want to tell people how exactly to do that unless there's some issue. And then, you know, let's say, okay, well, maybe we need to focus and normalize this area and then open it up once we've sort of hit a good line. Um, does that make sense, Connie? Does that answer your question? Cool. Cool. Thanks very much, everyone. Appreciate the questions.